Greetings. I'm Ron Leibowitz, president of Brandeis, and my wife Jessica and I welcome you as we celebrate Sir Ronald Cohen as this year's recipient of the Fullmetal Award for Excellence in Global Business Leadership. I know my wife is out there uh, coming here by car, so she's tuning in in one of those boxes. The Promoter Award is given to individuals who have demonstrated exceptional leadership worldwide. It honors those whose career is in business, finance, government, and other related fields to embody the values promoted by the Promoter Institute. The Promoter Institute was founded by Lou Promoter, a graduate of the Brandeis class of 1956, and his wife, Barbara Promoter. From its founding in 2008, the Institute has had a twofold mission. First, to advance teaching and research on the interrelationship between business practice, the global economy, government, government and civil society. And second, to prepare future leaders for success in a complex and dynamically changing global environment. Lou and Barbara have been longstanding supporters of Brandeis, and I know I speak for so many in expressing my gratitude to Lou and Barbara for all they have done to support Brandeis, and especially its students at both the undergraduate and graduate levels. Recent recipients of the Promoter Award have included Aaron Ain, CEO and Chairman of the Ultimate Kronos Group, Charles Phillips, CEO of Infor, and President and CEO of Siemens USA, Eric Spiegel. This year, we honor Sir Ronald Cohen with the Promoter Award. Mr. Cohen is being given this year's award in recognition of his commitments to global prosperity, respect for the international cultural diversity, and business professionalism at the highest levels. He is a visionary leader of how philanthropy and business can go hand in hand. Later in the program, Mr. Cohn will participate in a fireside conversation with Brandeis professor and Promoter Institute faculty director, Aldo Masacchio. But first, I wanna introduce the Dean of the Business School, Katie Grady. Dean Grady is Dean and the Fred and Rita Richmond Distinguished Professor in Economics. She previously served as Senior Associate Dean and PhD Program Director at the Business School. Dean Grady is also the former chair of the university's Department of Economics. Under her leadership, the school achieved STEM designations for its core programs, developed a new master's in business analytics, and expanded partnerships with academic institutions worldwide. Her research focuses on the economics of art, culture, and more generally, industrial organization. She is the former editor of the Journal of Cultural Economics and has published papers in top international journals. Katie came to Brandeis from Oxford University in 2007. She received her PhD in economics from Princeton, her MBA from Columbia, and her BS and BA in mathematics and Russian from Tulane. As Dean, Katie leads a highly ranked, globally focused business school that prepares both graduate and undergraduate students to excel across political boundaries and multiple cultures. Katie. Thank you, President Leibowitz. Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us. My name is Katherine Grady. I'm the Dean of Brandeis International Business School and the Fred and Rita Richmond Distinguished Professor in Economics. It is our distinct honor today to present the 2022 Perlmutter Award for Excellence in Global Business Leadership to Sir Ronald Cohen, a pioneering philanthropist, venture capitalist, private equity investor, and social innovator. We have a great discussion planned today as Sir Ronald will be joined in just a moment by Professor Aldo Misakio. Toward the end of our discussion, we will also have time for a brief question and answer session. So for everyone in our virtual audience, please feel free to submit a question using the Q&A function on your screen. Before I share more about Sir Ronald's accomplishments, I'd like to thank the founders of the Perlmutter Institute for Global Business Leadership, Lewis and Barbara Perlmutter. The Perlmutter Institute has provided a foundation for the International Business School to excel. We are extremely grateful to the Perlmutters for their vision and generosity. The Perlmutter Award is given to a highly select group of individuals who have demonstrated exceptional leadership worldwide. The award honors those whose careers in business, finance, government, and related fields embody the values promoted by the Perlmutter Institute, a vision that transcends national borders the highest levels of professionalism, and a commitment to the global community and its prosperity. It is now my pleasure to introduce today's honoree. Sir Ronald Cohen is recognized as the father of both impact investment and European venture capital. He is a driving force behind what he calls the global impact revolution. Educated at Oxford and Harvard, Sir Ronald was born in Egypt. He left as a refugee at age 11, moving with his family to the UK. 
He is now based in Tel Aviv, London, and New York. Sir Ronald serves as chairman of the Global Steering Group for Impact Investment. He is also chairman of the Impact Weighted Accounts Initiative at Harvard Business School and chairman of the Portland Trust. Sir Ronald was a co-founder and the former executive chairman of Apex Partners Worldwide, a global private equity firm. He was also a co-founder of Social Finance UK, USA, and Israel, a co-founding chair of Bridges Fund Management and the former co-founding chair of Big Society Capital. Sir Ronald is the author of Impact, Reshaping Capitalism to Drive Real Change. Okay, we will now have the award presentation. Sir Ronald, thank you so much for joining us today. On behalf of the Perlmutter Institute at Brandeis International Business School, we are delighted to honor you with the 2022 Perlmutter Award for Excellence in Global Business Leadership. I will now read the award description. Brandeis University celebrates and honors Sir Ronald Cohen, Chairman of the Global Steering Group for Impact Investment for Excellence in Global Business Leadership. Congratulations, Sir Ronald, and please do, please share a few, a few, few words. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Dean Grady, President uh, Leibovitz, uh, and all of you uh, for joining us uh, today and for honoring me with uh, this award, which I view as a recognition uh, of impact, uh, as well as the role that I have been able to play in bringing impact to become a mainstream subject. And if I may, Dean Grady, I will just say a few words about my path since the business school. Since all of you are looking forward to careers that will hopefully bring you fame and fortune. When I was your age and sitting on the benches of uh, Harvard Business School, I sensed that something was in the air. Technology was beginning to raise its head and entrepreneurship was married to it. And venture capital came as a new way of funding entrepreneurs. Now, most of my cohort at business school was looking for jobs in big businesses working for IBM or Rio Tinto Zinc or General Motors. And very few at that time thought that small businesses led by inexperienced entrepreneurs in conventional terms could possibly threaten the leadership position of big established century old firms. And of course, as we all know, this is exactly what happened. And we've seen most of the top companies in the world today in the top 10 and 20 come to their position as leaders, as global leaders in the space of three decades or so. Well, my message to you all today is you're very fortunate, as I have been, to be living in a similar time. Because three very powerful forces are coming together to stretch out a path before you that really can take you, not just to fame and fortune, but to greater meaning in your lives. Those forces are the change in values, which has led many of you and many others around the world to move away from the products that companies that pollute produce or companies that use child labor or otherwise follow undesirable employment practices. It started with young people like yourselves, and it spread to a much broader population. And talent followed 
talent began to avoid working for companies like those I described. And investors noticed it. And today, $40 trillion of environmental, social, and governance money, ESG as it is called, is flowing to achieve both impact and profit. And the world of impact investment, which shares the intention of ESG, but measures the impact created and manages the impact created, is over two trillion, with a trillion last year raised from a standing start the year before in sustainability linked bonds and loans. So something massive is changing in values and in our financial markets. And it's coming together with the force of technology. Technology is taking leaps now through artificial intelligence, machine learning, augmented reality, through the genome and powerful computing coming together that enable us to deliver impact globally, to improve lives and the environment globally in ways that humanity could never previously contemplate. And if you take these two forces together, you begin to understand that companies which, like Tesla, have brought impact to the core of their businesses, don't just improve our environment and the lives of people, but by doing so, give the answer to the question you're all asking yourselves, which is the meaning of your lives. I left Apex Partners at the age of 60 because I didn't want my epitaph to read he delivered a 30% return. Life is about a lot more than that. Fulfillment in life comes from a balance between what you do for yourselves and what you do for others. And impact investment by bringing together the meaning that comes with improving other people's lives and preserving the future of our planet. And with technology and entrepreneurship is creating a new set of disruptive opportunities for entrepreneurs in a revolution which is going to mirror the tech revolution on which it is building. Tesla was a company that didn't just want to dominate the automobile industry. It wanted to move us away from the harmful emissions of the combustion engine. And everywhere across the world, everywhere, I see entrepreneurs now developing new business models that mean that the more good they do, the more profit they make. Doing good and doing well at the same time is what is going to mark your generation. Whereas mine went by the convention that you make money every which way you can without worrying about any consequences. And then you become a magnificent philanthropist in the later stages of your life. Well, this has changed. And you have the opportunity, whether you aim to be an entrepreneur, to work for a large company, to work in the philanthropy, or to work in government, you have the opportunity to bring the two together, to take advantage of the change in values, which has brought the change in financial markets and the advance of technology to develop or influence businesses, governments, philanthropies, to use the more effective ways of impact investment, not just in delivering impact, but even in making profit. For I firmly believe that optimizing risk, return, and impact 
delivers better financial returns than just optimizing risk and return. And I'll close by saying that this change is becoming not just mainstream in terms of thinking, but it's also doing so in terms of regulation. Many of you will have seen the announcement by the SEC a few days ago, which talked about introducing the mandatory disclosure by businesses of all the impacts they create on the environment, including their supply chains. You may have noticed that at the time of COP26, the announcement was made by the foundation responsible for all financial accounting across the world except the United States, the IFRS Foundation, that it was establishing an international sustainability standards board to standardize the measurement of both environmental and social impact. And so we're moving to a world where just making money will become a dirty phrase. Businesses that optimize risk, return, and impact are going to be the leading businesses of tomorrow. And an impact venture, for those of you who want to become entrepreneurs or venture capitalists, will be one that doesn't just reach a value of a billion dollars, but also improves the lives of a billion people. So I wish you well in your careers and urge you to take advantage of the huge opportunity before you to lead an improvement in lives and in our planet. Thank you. Thank you so much for these important words. I will now turn the program over to Professor Aldo Misakio. Professor Misakio is a professor of international business. He is also the director of our MBA program and the director of the Perlmutter Institute for Global Business Leadership. Professor Misakio has published extensively in top journals and published four books. His research focuses on the internationalization strategies of state-owned enterprises and the innovation behavior of large multinationals with government financial support. Before moving to Brandeis, Aldo started his career at the Harvard Business School. Professor Masakio, the floor is yours. I'm very much looking forward to this um, chat. Thank you. Oh, hello, thank you, Katie. And to Ronald Cohen, it's, it's really an honor to uh, be in the ceremony with you. I cannot think of someone whose life embodies better basically the values of the Institute and what I think is, is modern global leadership. Uh, both in your career, I feel you embodied exactly the values that we want to promote at the Institute, but also what you promote with your writings and, and, and the thousands of hours of videos on YouTube is basically doing the, the preaching that we want and we need in the world. And, and you obviously know you're preaching to the choir. Uh, we all believe in what you have done. We have a class on impact investing that my colleague Philip Wells teaches. We have multiple classes on impact, social enterprise. Even in our entrepreneurship classes, we teach about impact. Yet, I, I wonder uh, when you were trying to promote this early on, you must have encountered like tremendous obstacles. I just wanted to see if you can tell us like two or three of these experiences in which you had to overcome basically a, a world that didn't believe in you in, in, in what you were preaching. So uh, it's never easy uh, to start a new field or a new way of thinking. And it takes time, uh, Aldo, if I may call you Aldo, please call me Ronnie. It takes time. For me, the birth of impact investment goes back to the first social impact bond in 2010. It was the first time that the security was used where the return depended on a social improvement. In that particular case, a reduction in reoffending by young prisoners who had been released from jail. So if we look at the last 12 
years or so, we can see a huge acceleration. In the early years, when I spoke to my friends in the private equity or venture capital industry or you know, on, on the investment boards where I sat and talked about public securities and bond markets uh, about to undergo a revolution, people didn't dismiss the idea completely, but they were hugely skeptical about it. What's happened over the last 12 years is we've seen values transformed into capital flows. We've seen this change of mood about the meaning of, of business, the meaning of the lives of entrepreneurs and executives and, and leaders that took them in the direction of saying, if we are in business just to make money and we're contributing to destroy the planet and create social issues by excluding people from employment, is this really a life that we want to have? Is it creating the type of world that we want to live in? And what's been interesting for me, Aldo, is that governments and philanthropists have understood it and accepted it least. If you look at what's happened with the social impact bond, sure, there are 225 across 35 countries dealing with 15 different social issues and delivering great improvements in, in, in lives and sometimes in the planet. But they've raised in total half a billion dollars. Why? Because governments who should have been paying for the results and encouraging investors to fund the organization seeking to achieve the results, be they improvements in attainment levels in, in education or reduction in recidivism or in homelessness, whatever the social uh, issue. You compare that with the capital markets. And as I said, in one year alone, a trillion dollars of sustainability linked bonds and, and, and loans have been raised. So the obstacles have been less with the capital markets, frankly, because if you'd said to me in 2010, when I played the role in inventing the first social impact bond, 12 years from now, you'll have 2 trillion that is following that concept and the trillion totally inspired by it, I would have said, well, that would be unbelievable. You know, so I, I wouldn't say that the obstacles have been obvious. I wouldn't say they have been obvious, but looking back, they have been mainly with government and philanthropists. And, and, and now that we have all accepted that DSG is so important and that we need to incorporate all these indicators and that green bonds matter and that we have ESG investing, impact investing, impact VC funds, et cetera, et cetera, what do you think are like the two or three op, like main obstacles that, that remain to, to get to the panacea of impact capitalism? Transparency. You're beginning to see greenwashing, as you well know. Companies are making claims that are unsubstantiated very often, and even more often through omission and not giving a totally accurate picture of their impact. And what encourages me is that this transparency, which is really the resting point for finance as a lever to change the behavior of the companies. This transparency is now on the way. And I'll make a prediction today, Aldo, that within three to five years, we will have the mandatory publication of impact statements by companies showing their revenues, their costs, and four different categories of impact in monetary terms, expressed in monetary terms, environmental impact from operations, employment impact, product impact on people and the environment, and supply chain impact on people and the environment. And the reason, anticipating your next question, is that we can see already 
In the Harvard work of the Impact Weighted Accounts Initiative, which I'm privileged to chair, that there is a correlation between lower stock market value and higher level of pollution in many sectors. It turns out that some people have much better, some companies have much better impact performance than others, and they end up being valued more highly on the stock exchange. Now that poses a huge challenge, as you know, for regulators who have to ensure that price sensitive information reaches everyone on a comparable verified basis. And that's why you're beginning to see a re regulation move with the SEC and the ISSB announcements. I, I, I am like totally excited about having the SEC enforcing like a scope one, scope two emissions reporting. But my concern is that a lot of the ESG indicators that the big companies use today are actually based on self-reported information. And so I don't know how you think, I mean, I know you, you think of this because in your book, you actually have an entire chapter on this. Um, like what can we do to really make sure that we have objective measures and enforcement of those objective measures? So investors are driving regulation today. The role of reg financial regulators uh, is to make sure that investors have the information they need. The corporate world has tried to define impact as anything that's of a social or an environmental nature that affects the profit of the company. But the investors are defining it as anything in the social or environmental value, uh, area that affects the value of a company. And the company can see its uh, price earnings multiple, its valuation on the stock exchange crash because of harm that it is causing, even though it doesn't immediately affect that harmful way to deliver profits hasn't in the past affected the profits of the company. So there's going to be a shift in, in thinking. So each and every one of us in this conversation has a role to play in this impact revolution. But we must all together push for this transparency. This transparency is akin to the transparency on profit that came after the crash the Wall Street crash of 1929. Four years later, we had the introduction of gap accounting principles against the protestations of people that it would be impossible to have a single set of accounting principles for every company, irrespective of size or, or sector, and that if you were able to do it, it would spell the end of American capitalism. In those days, as some of you may know, every company picked its own accounting uh, 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 policies, and there were no auditors to verify the numbers. Well, it took four years to get to the gap legislation, which uh, the Roosevelt administration introduced in, in, in 33, and the future uh, showed that every country in the world followed it. It's taken us two and a bit years to get to the ISSB and the SEC announcement after the crash of 2019, the COVID crash. And so I am, I am of the view uh, that, that we could do things faster and we will do things faster than you know we did almost a century ago. So that's why I'm I'm so confident in making this prediction. So so the idea is the, the, the auditing firms, the regulators, investors, they all basically are aligned, and that's what's gonna create the the enforcement i i really really wish we are we're we're right on this because this is what we need i wanted to ask you like there's a big question that concerns us all uh, at brandeis uh, which is the net net zero objectives the un development goals and and like the cop 25 to cop 26 commitments of governments and companies how optimistic or pessimistic are you about whether we're going to meet those commitments so I think we need to understand that the reason we've not made more progress on climate is we've been thinking that governments create pollution. Governments don't create pollution. Companies create pollution. And so the transparency we're talking about 
gives investors the ability to change the behavior of companies. That's why you see the Exxon Mobil. Oh, we have a we have a young impact warrior here. That, I am so sorry. I'm having a BBC moment here. Wonderful, wonderful. That's why we see the Exxon Mobil shareholder rebellion kicking three directors off the board and appointing uh, three new ones that the board didn't, you know, didn't want. And that's why we see shareholders at the Procter and Gamble meeting requiring management to explain the extent of deforestation that comes from uh, its use of palm oil. So we have to bring this transparency now for investors to be able to make rational decisions about which companies are going to be more valuable in the future. If a company lags in terms of environmental emissions, it's going to have to make investments to change its operations. If its products deliver harm because of high sugar content that causes uh, health hazards like diabetes and obesity, then it's going to have to refashion its uh, product content. Uh, if its supply chain similarly uh, is, is uh, creating negative consequences, it's going to have to change them. So we need this transparency now. And as I said, it's on the way. We see it in the SEC and the ISSB announcements. And how about, because you talked about companies, but you didn't talk about <laughs> governments. How about governments? Like, do we believe governments are going to fulfill their commitment? I, I think the Biden administration and the EU have both taken very important steps in showing that government is prepared to create the environment we need for investors to be able to make decisions based both on profit and on impact performance. Shifting our economic system, as I say in, in my book, from a risk return system, the invisible hand of the market that Adam Smith uh, uh, named, to risk return and impact, a system where the invisible heart of the market guides its invisible hand. Both steps have been taken. There is pushback from big business. Big business generally sees a challenge in this greater transparency, which I have explained increased investment, potential loss of sales, loss of talent, and a new element in competition. Uh, many don't believe that this is uh, necessary. And yet there are 100 businesses, uh, as the IWAI at Harvard has, uh, has shown, I think it had 56 in the initial report that are actually implementing now impact measurement and impact valuation. So there are thought leaders, a hundred uh, or more across the world, but the corporate world is going to push back against the SEC during the next 60 days of, um, of consultation. So government is, sitting, government is sitting between the pressure of consumers, talent and investors, and the pressure of cooperation. In the end, you can work out for yourself who is likely to win. Great. Philippe, uh, I'm going to bring in my colleague, Philippe Wells, who teaches the Impact Investing Class because he has a couple of questions. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Aldo. Thank you um, so much as well, uh, Ronnie, for uh, the answers you've given so far. I guess. I want to, I mean, so Aldo, you've given us a great, both of you have given us a great, um, I guess, overview and perspective on the, you know, the government and the big picture. I, I wanted to get a little bit more to uh, the, the individual level. How do we think about this as individuals? And actually, I wanted to start with, with your experience. So you started Apex, I believe, at the age of 26, if I'm not mistaken. And, you know, we have a lot of 
students here on the on the call uh, who are roughly that age, some a little bit younger, some a little bit older. How do you think? So you basically took something that was quite new. I mean, I, you had exposure to it in the U.S. venture capital, and you brought it to Europe. It was a different way of thinking. We're talking here about a different way of thinking. Um, how do you do that? And what were the obstacles that you encountered yourself at such a young age without you know, much experience of any type really necessarily to fall back on as a track record? So what, what's your recommendation and learning from that? So the first, the first thing is, as, as I said in my first book, The Second Bounce of the Ball, which was about entrepreneurship and venture capital. My motto is start young, think big, and stick with it. Why? Because when you're talking of a completely new way of thinking, as, as you've said, uh, uh, Philip, the experience doesn't help you. What helps you is to get in early and gain more experience than those who are going to come after you. And so getting into venture capital early at the time when very few people had any skills in, in venture capital was absolutely the right thing to do. If I continued, I worked for McKinsey for two years or so before I set up Apex. If I'd continued for 10, it wouldn't have prepared me for a better career in, in venture capital. And I used to say to people who wondered about how wise I was to dive in uh, so early, I had lots of friends, most of my friends thought I was mad. I used to say, you can't learn to swim by doing exercises on the beach. You actually have to get into the water. Now, this impact thinking is a different mindset in a way it's a different dna for a business because when you begin to think in terms of impact you begin to reduce the risk involved in regulation taxation talent and consumers deserting you because of uh, you know the bad things your operations or or products are, are doing and eventually investors deserting you right but you also open the door to new sets of opportunities that you wouldn't have come across had you not thought about impact. And I give an example in the book, which is a very telling one. It's a company called Orcam, which is here in Israel from, from where I speak today. I'm speaking to you from Tel Aviv. And Orcam was set up by two entrepreneurs who built a $15 billion venture they sold to Intel, Mobileye. The aunt of one of the entrepreneurs, Professor Amnon Shafro, an academic, interestingly, in, artificial, in the field of artificial intelligence, was going blind. And she asked him to help, and he created OrCam to help the blind. And he created a pair of spectacles with a little device that hangs off one of the arms that whispers into the ear of the wearer, the page of the book or newspaper they're reading and recognizes up to 300 uh, uh, faces. Now you'd say, wow, what an unbelievable impact venture. 35 million blind people in the world, 250 million visually impaired people, market of 300 million people in the world. But if you think like an impact entrepreneur, and I hope this will bring ideas to, to all of the, the students uh, listening today, you ask yourself the question, how can my technology help the greatest number of people in the world? And you get a surprising answer you certainly wouldn't have discovered if you hadn't asked the question, which is what if you provided these spectacles to the 800 million illiterate adults in the world. What would that do for their lives, for their economies, or even for the global economy to bring nearly 10% of the population uh, to, to reading? And so you discover <coughs> new latent demand that you access through different business models providing perhaps these spectacles 
free to the user and having them pay back from an increase in the remuneration they get, which you wouldn't have thought of before. And they go in, in the direction that um, we're taking anyway with remote learning, with new educational models where the student pays at the end of their, you know, the end of their education when they've got into a job. So I hope, I hope that um, Philip um, gives everyone in this conversation a sense that we're talking about a new way of doing business and it holds huge promise huge promise to disrupt existing models that are either causing harm or failing to bring solutions to the great challenges that uh, we face. Great. And actually, following up on that, I, I wonder if I can get you to reflect a, reflect a little bit more on this idea of changing the way that we think about business and changing the way that we think about opportunity. Because to a certain extent, as I listen to your answer, I hear a little bit of the uh, theories of, of Michael Porter and Mark Kramer and creating shared value, which, of course, you also talk about in the book. And, you know, I, I so personally, as I think about the example of, of Orca, and basically taking this mobile eye technology developed for vehicles and driving and saying, well, why don't I apply it to my aunt who has issues seeing? I think it's on the one hand, both more abstract and also more concrete and immediate than we think of typically in business. And so what I mean by that is the mobile eye technology originally was, well, we have a business problem. We're trying to sell these cars. We're trying to make them self-driving. Let's go along that path of developing more technology for this product. But so that's kind of the traditional way. The new way of thinking, which I'm inviting you to reflect on a little bit more in terms of how do we get people to think more like that, I feel this new way of thinking is a little bit more abstract. We step back from the product, but then we literally think, well, what about my aunt? What about my cousin? What about my you know friend? I actually have this technology rather than the car. How could I like directly plug it into their lives. Can you talk a little bit more about how we get there? Yeah, no, you're absolutely right, Philippe. At the time when uh, the microchip came out, I remember when the first PC followed it, people saying this is only going to change the computer industry, right? They could never have dreamt uh, that they were going to the cellular phone, into the internet, and that it would threaten retailing models with companies like Amazon, uh, you know, arising. The same is going to be true with impact. So, to be very concrete about it, I still invest in early stage, very early stage, tech impact ventures. I've invested in a company which produces software to manage public transport systems, right? In the old days, we'd have said, great, how much money can you make? And they would have me measured their profit. But the entrepreneur believes in impact, wants to improve the world. So he says, no, in addition to profit, I'm going to measure reduction in commuting time because commuting time affects more vulnerable populations. I'm going to measure carbon emission reduction because of improvement in the routes, matching the vehicle to the demand at different times of day, having vehicles of different size. I'm going to improve the lives of the drivers by having more effective scheduling where they don't have to do unexpectedly long hours. And I'm going to reduce the number of accidents caused. And so this is a traditional business, but all of a sudden it's competing on two dimensions with its, you know, with, with others in its industry. It's competing on the profit side and on the impact side. Now you can see how blending those two different dimensions attracts talent, right? Because everybody today, you, you know, I was going to say almost uh, irrespective of age, certainly below the age of, of 40, everybody today is looking for greater meaning and being able to improve the lives of people by working for a company of, of, of this kind 
um, is a lot more attractive than going to work for a traditional computer software company. At the same time, its customers are very interested in showing that they too are acting responsibly vis-a-vis -vis of their clients and, 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 and the environment and so on and, and so forth. And so all of a sudden you have what would have been a traditional business model, right? Like pre-technology being affected by a combination of technology and this time of new KPIs, of new uh, performance, indica performance indicators that relate to impact. Now, I could give you 20 examples of this kind. In the payroll area, you're finding companies that are setting up uh, to allow uh, growth firms to expand globally without setting up any subsidiaries, worrying about any of the accounting or legal uh, obstacles uh, in the way. Uh, you might have focused on that only, but if the entrepreneur believes in impact, which she does in, in, in this case, the entrepreneur begins to analyze whether the firm is underpaying relative to others in its industry, whether there is a diversity that is similar to the rest of the industry or to the demographics for that matter, in the country versus the demographics in the firm. So you're managing two dimensions to develop a more effective model, which appeals more widely to all the different stakeholders. And FinTech, I haven't talked about them, I mean, you could get me going for an hour and a half on this. FinTech, FinTech is disrupting the banking industry now. The banking industry is doing its best to keep up with the new ventures, which are hitting of the soft underbelly of banking. Uh, overdrafts that cost 10 to 15%, which are charged to the most vulnerable, when actually the credit worthiness, if you measure it in, you know, in, in, in new ways, the credit worthiness can be as high as the wealthy customers of a, of, of a bank, you know? And so FinTech is going to go through a massive, a massive revolution. So investors are aware of this. They're watching these spaces. $16 billion of venture capital went into climate ventures last year, you know? So investors are aware of it. They see the opportunity. Venture capitalists are following uh, the entrepreneurs. Private equity firms have you know, moved in even earlier than venture capital. You see specialist funds being set up. And we see this transparency I've been talking about through impact accounting, transforming 40 trillion plus, growing at 20 years, 20% 20 a year, uh, into impact investment, where you actually measure the impact and you can't hide any more than you can hide your, your profits. You can, of course, <laughs> hide your profits, but within the bounds of, 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 profit, of, of, of profit accounting, uh, we will do the same with impact accounting. Thank you. Um... Yes, let, let's not get too deep into fintech because I agree we could talk about that for, for hours and hours. And um, I, I do want to actually switch over the focus and bring in some of the audience questions. I think some of your uh, just remarks you just made about KPIs and, and measurements and different target demographics brought up a question here, which is, did your very early experience as a management consultant help to prepare you for your current role as a social innovator? Business school and consulting, which is a super business school where you implement what you've learned to basically enable me to do uh, what I have done. Without it, I would not have been able to do it in, in the same way and perhaps not at all. Uh, you know, in my early 20s, 
Uh, I was part of teams that were advising the very top management of you know the biggest of the biggest companies. And my, my business school education gave me the tools to, to do that. That's why I believe that the business schools are the vanguards of this impact revolution. Because if you think about its engine, its engine is really the entrepreneurs uh, and the funders of these entrepreneurs through private or, or public markets. Yes. Well, thank you for that answer. Thank you for also uh, speaking positively about what we're doing here. And I do agree with you. It is a great preparation. Let's see. Um, so I've got a couple more questions from the audience. Let me give, uh, here's the next one. So from my studies, I felt it was easier to have a standard to measure environmental issues. Still, we come from different cultures and have different perspectives. So how do we reach a commonly adapted social measurement that would be acceptable to most people in the world? Great question. And I encourage uh, you all to go to IWAI at uh, HBS and look at the employment impacts of 2,600 companies in monetary terms. To go to the punchline, you can compare Amazon and Apple's diversity in the case of Amazon, it's a $6.5 billion diversity debit, meaning the difference in demographics in the area of Amazon's facilities and their employment demographics and describing a salary level to the missing representatives of gender groups or ethnic groups. So you take the lost salaries to a community as the economic cost of, uh, of exclusion. You compare that 6.5 with Apple, Apple has from memory about $2.7 billion annual diversity debit. But if you relate it as, to the wage bill, Amazon is the better performer. Amazon has 16% of its wage bill in diversity debit, and Apple has 25%. And so you can begin to see how you can measure diversity. You can measure differences in pay between gender, ethnic backgrounds, and so on. You can measure those who are underpaying relative to the minimum wage. And over time, you will be measuring relative to benchmarks in the sector of what competitors are paying, because it's a, it's a social, it's a social um, uh, practice which will become unacceptable and businesses are going to have to conform with uh, the new uh, mores, uh, the new uh, moral rules of, of, of the game uh, that are established. So although it seemed much more challenging than measuring the environment, uh, my environmental impact on which we've been working for three or four decades, we've actually found ways to do that. And, uh, and we will see shareholders' resolutions coming up uh, with both environmental and uh, social uh, demands on, on the part of companies. Black Lives Matter, the Gilets Jaunes, uh, the rebellions in, in Chile about uh, economic inequality, these recurring rebellions are going to force uh, the social agenda alongside uh, the environmental one. Great. Well, I think that kind of leads actually into our next and, and I think our, our last question, actually. Um, let's see. So congratulations to the well-deserved award. I wonder what your view is on social enterprises, those entrepreneurial entities that combine both elements of for-profit and non-profit ventures and likely, like in the UK, are subject to a distinct tax code, also an integration of conventional for-profit and non-for-profit tax regulations. Thank so you. The beauty, the, thank you for an excellent question. The beauty of this new world of impact is that a social entrepreneur 
can aspire to use the most appropriate form of company to achieve the particular goal. My experience so far suggests that if you're providing a service that requires the support of the community, like the absorption of prisoners into employment, it's much easier to achieve great results with a philanthropic model where your motives aren't questioned by the, the community of employers than um, if you use a profit with purpose model. model. Where you're talking in terms of products, growth, cash flows, then you're better off using a profit with purpose model. Now the B Corp movement has driven distinctions between companies that have this higher social and environmental purpose as well as a profit purpose and other companies. And I think over time, as I've been suggesting, we're going to gravitate to every company having to have some type of B Corp um, uh, forgive me, I, I was being called the way, but we were almost finished. Uh, uh, the B Corp movement has made this distinction easier for investors to understand. So investors can just look at the B Corp or talent can look at the B Corp and say, right, this is the right, you know, the right type of company. It has it has the right type of objectives, um, you know, for me. Now, social enterprises, and they exist in many countries, including the UK, so to fall in between these different forms, um, the B Corp and the philanthropy and the limited um, uh, company, um, and they are, you know, appropriate for a, a, a form of labeling that says, look, we're not seeking to maximize the profit. We're seeking to maximize the impact, but we're using a uh, profit with purpose model. Perfect. Well, thank you so much for that answer. And actually the, the, the timing is, is perfect, I think, on all ends here. So congratulations again to Sir Ronald Cohen on behalf of everyone at the business school. We hope to see you all again soon. Thank you also to Lou and Barbara Perlmutter, the founders of the Perlmutter Institute for joining today and for making an event like this today possible. So take care and wherever you are in the world, have a great morning, afternoon or evening. Goodbye. <laughs>